Um, I don't have much to add to what Denai said. Um, the, the work that um, both Denai and I do is always a marriage of art and activism. And um, one of the things that I, I feel very strongly about when I do this kind of um, theater is for the audience not to feel like they are watching um, how those people over there live their lives because it's not what that's about. We are meant to watch and communally experience the, you know, um, something that can happen to any one of us depending on where we live. And there is no other, um, from, for me, when I'm creating art. The, whole, the purpose of theater is to create community. The purpose of theater is to create unity, the unity of being a human being. Um, and so that's, you know, that's sort of what I throw out on the stage. And um, the, this campaign that we have embarked upon um, is, is just the embodiment of the art and the acti activism. Um, yeah. That's great. Um, Denai, I'm wondering if you can take us back to the early days of when you were starting to develop this play and what your inspirations were and how it evolved. Sure. It, it, it does always take a village, and that's always something I always say. I always believe in the, the power of the collective, and I've been creating pieces in grad school, always around these issues, marrying my art with my activism, um, and I've been doing it a lot, and so I, some teachers and people took note of that, and one of my professors who um, sadly passed last year in 2003 handed me a New York Times article. He said, I know you like to tell stories about African women and uh, their experiences, so I thought you'd want to see this article. And it was an article about the woman Black Diamond, who was um, a, a, a rebel soldier in the Lord Army and deeply formidable. And she had these, you know, cute clothes on, like you see number two wearing, and you know, hair all did, and, and an AK-47. And I said, what? And I'd grown up in a whole other part of Africa, which is post-war, very pristine. And I didn't have any, I'd never seen anything like this. And I knew at some point I would have to pursue that narrative. And uh, I did a, a play before that that I co-performed, so I um, that I co-created, and, and so I I was very busy with it, but I kept saying I've got to get back to that narrative. Mm -hmm. And then when I did, uh, thankfully with the support of the, it always takes a village, uh, Macarta Theater, I was able to go to Liberia, and that's where uh, I was completely transformed. And the narrative I thought I was going to tell was transformed because I met women who uh, em embraced me who uh, enveloped me in, in love and, in, in, and totally allowed me to be, uh, op opened up to me about things they'd never told anyone. They told me um, things that they'd never been asked. And uh, there was, it's such a, it was such an amazing gamut of women, from a woman who, who did a lot of uh, performances for different new products and nightclubs, to a woman who was a massive human rights activist and, and a, one of the chief peace women uh, that you, like who you saw in the play, but a woman who was really well known for that. And she took me in and had me teach her activist artists how to act and create stories better, because in her mind, she, as she put it, she was sick of what they were doing. Um, <laughs> But actually through that interaction, I got to meet so many different personalities. A lot of the women that I taught in those classes became the names and the personalities, inspired the names and the personalities you see on the stage. Um, and I met lots of girls like the ones you meet, you meet on the stage who, who, um, who tragically and, and, and horrifically went through things I can't even fathom. And um, so that sort of became how the, 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 I got deeply transformed through that time and it caused me to uh, write the narrative in a very different way than what I'd anticipated and go into places that were uncomfortable for me, where there's conflict, where people are making decisions that are complex. And I was like, I'm probably gonna get in trouble for this, but um, that's when I probably know I'm on the right track in terms of I'm stepping into something uncomfortable. I'm stepping into something that's gonna make an audience uncomfortable, it's making me uncomfortable. But it's step stepping into the truth of how, uh, what, what is war? It's something that transforms everyone often into something they weren't before. And it often robs those most vulnerable of their own senses of self-determination and ability to make their own choices and to live in a society that protects them. And so what does that make them become? And so the idea of making sure each of these women manifested um, those different responses 
and I was watching the final scene and just the idea of, you know, the, the, these are people that I've pulled from actually meeting or from research, but the idea of a Bessie saying, I'm gonna stay. And there is, there were accounts of girls who chose that. And um, you can't, I, the thing I always said was I can't judge any of them. I love them all equally. I love each of these characters. I don't judge Maima. Some people, someone said to me, Maima's evil. I said, no, she's not. <laughs> Maima makes perfect sense to me because she became a weapon of war. She became a good weapon of war. That's what war wants you to become. And it's the only way she could find to protect herself. It's the way she could find that worked for her. And it, she, it really was an act of needing to be, to find some, some degree of making your, having some degree of freedom in a world that is so distorted. And so um, to me, I always say, I dare, I dare you to judge any of them. I can't, I can't judge any of these women. So that was, um, that's really the impetus of it all. I think that we would all agree, Liesl, that the emotional honesty and the depth of experience. Oh, great. Oh, here's our beautiful cast. Lupita Nyong'o, welcome. Stay calm. You guys are just in time because I was actually going to ask these little questions about the performances. Um, and so my question was, the emotional honesty and the depth of experience that we're seeing portrayed on the stage is just so profound. And I thought maybe Liesl and you guys can chime in and just share a little bit about what your process was as actors, as a director, Denai, feel free to chime in as writer, what that process was to specifically work on this show. And how do you get inside these characters to bring these kinds of performances alive on stage? You know, um, I have a pretty strong point of view, a pretty strong aesthetic in terms of what I um, what I think performance should be in a piece like this, and it, it harkens back to what I said earlier, which is that I don't want there to be any intellectual or emotional distance between the audience and the um, and the actors. I want you to lean in, uh, literally lean in to the story. Um, and that requires a kind of rigor in the, in the rehearsal process um, that for me begins with research. Because if you do historical or political um, theater, you have to immerse yourself in, into the world. You have to have total context. Um, so fortunately, you, know, you also hire um, terrific actresses who have an insane work ethic and are right there with you in terms of the depth of the research. So, you know, we spent a few days in the beginning um, looking at documentary after documentary, and, and I, I'm from South Africa. I, I grew up during the apartheid era, and I have um, that pain that comes from, um, you know, that book, Cry the Beloved Country. Yeah. If you've lived through um, uh, historical pain, political pain for your country, um, it is, it's palpable and it shapes who you are forever. And that's certainly how I feel. Um, and I felt like for these women to inhabit the characters and the story and the place, their hearts had to break for their country the way that the real women's hearts had to break for their country. And the way to do that is to immerse yourself in the, in the research, in the history, the political history, um, <clears throat> from before colonialism through to today. So they, have, they are deeply connected to um, this place whose story we are privileged enough to tell. Um, so that's the beginning part, and then um, it's just sort of relentless investigation into Danai's script, into um, the relationships, and into um, the hearts and souls of, of these ladies. Um, I know there were probably days where they never wanted to see my face again, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, you know, um, it's, it, it matters too much for it to be anything other than um, completely realized. You know, I, I don't want people to, I, as I said before, I want people to feel like they're not watching a play, that they're watching these actual women's lives unfold. Um, I think that these women 
deserve that um, commitment. Can I just say one thing about Liesl? Um, <laughs> it, the, 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 I forgot to mention the village that is Liesl. Um, you know, because it is, it is so crucial for this play to be in the right hands as, in terms of the director. Uh, you know, and she is, you know, when we met, I mean, we, we disagree on almost nothing. Um, <laughs> when we met, it was, it, was, it was such a clear match. And, um, it, but what I love about her is the, the fact that, as she said, you know, there might be days they never want to see her, they don't want to see her. But that's what's so beautiful, she creates an environment where they can fall and they can be so vulnerable. And because this is a play where you have to be private in public and you have to really let go and be so open and brave and, and, and brutal. And it, it requires a playwright who, I mean, playwright, a director who creates an environment that, that, where that is safe. And I, that can, and then also someone who's willing to push them if they need to be, which they're all astounding actors, but you know, there are those moments that everyone needs each other, that village. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's been so astounding to watch her work with this play over several productions because she, she's relentless. She's the real CEO. Yeah. I'm gonna pass the mic down the road, maybe. Everybody, you guys can just say a couple of words about what the process was like for you. <clears throat> um, okay, so I will just say, working with this team right here, Danai has written the map, the script, with, you know, we go down the road. And if there's ever any point in which we had a question, it was just a matter of going to research and asking questions and, and fig trying to figure out what the answer is. But going to the, the, the script and then um, having research, it was all, we, we could, there, there was no question that we couldn't find the answer to because we started off with a good map um, to begin with. So, um, yeah, all the research, the, the relentlessness that Lisa <laughs> powered into us and every, I mean, yeah. she, yeah. <laughs> and I'm the one who's taken the most abuse because I've been doing this show since 2008. I've done four productions of this show. So Lisa has beaten me over and over and over. <laughs> but I'm glad for the beating. She beat you into a Tony Award nomination. <laughs> yes, me too. We, this show has, we have six Tony nominations, and I think it's because um, this story is so meaningful for us as women, as people. I mean, it's, it, it has so much meaning for us, as she mentioned about. Uh, crying for your country or having some connection. We're each, uh, you know, representing in some part, some way, uh, the African diaspora from Sierra Leone, Liberia in America, uh, Kenya, Haiti, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. Wow. So, like, so we have Ghana, Ghana, um, I'm like a Kosua Busia from Ghana as well. We, you know, all the different things that, that may or may not have happened from our families or whatever, uh, or you know, on the continent of Africa and throughout the African diaspora, we, we feel those things and we bring it all to the map that has been laid out. And then our director has just directed us you know, with a fine tooth comb. You know, every step that we take, every breath that we breathe. I mean, literally, don't breathe there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, literally. So it's been... <laughs> <laughs> Literally, like, don't bring, don't drop the ball, don't drop the ball, don't drop the ball. That's, ah! You know, it's it's been a powerful, powerful, um, just piece of work to be a part of, and I'm so grateful and and uh, thankful to be a part of this. It is painful at times, you know. I go home and I watch a lot of random fluffy things on TV. <laughs> I watch animals being fluffy and cute, like just to keep it light. You know, you know, we all have our different ways of coping. But um, it's, it's a beautiful, powerful thing to be a part of, Eclipsed. Talking about breathing in the wrong places, I'm sorry I took some breaths tonight. <laughs> <laughs> had to be done. Shocking. I'm going to get beaten later. Actually, my experience working in this place, like, 
I love Danai and I love working with Lisa. And I've worked with Lisa many times and there's, there's a safety I feel with her where I know it's going to be painful, it's going to be hard and I'm going to crack and break but I also know that I'm not going to die. <laughs> you know? So I feel safe in going there and also working with these women, I feel so, we physically hold each other up off stage and on and that's been my experience and it's been so valuable to have sisters essentially you know, to tell these stories, which is what you need. We were bonded by these women's experiences. And from our personal experiences, where we come from in the world and why we had to make this, these women as real and actualized as we possibly can, because they exist, they're real, they're not just on paper. And so that's been my experience of this. And I, I, I break every night, not on stage, but I do. And uh, for good reason, I think, you know. I thought I didn't have anything to say until Sekhan said the word rap. And um, about Liesl's directing is that it is very specific, but at the same time, we, she gives us room to play. And to have that dynamic in a rehearsal room is so, so helpful because you have someone at the helm who you can trust, who you respect, who has a very clear agenda, but at the same time, she gives you the freedom to find your way through your, your work. And I think that equipped us with the independence to tell the story even when she's not in the room. And uh, the ability to rely on each other. And it's, I see this play as a tight rope being held up by the five of us. And sometimes some of us are feeling a little weaker than other times. And, the rest of us just compensate and we keep each other up and um, so for that reason it's been it's an eternally rewarding process because as hard as it is it's the hardest time for me is actually just getting ready for the play but once we're on stage it's so interesting because all the actors i feel their breath and you know as one breathes out the other breathes in and we're in the moment, and so every show feels new. Every show feels like a discovery, and that's why I love Eclipse. <laughs> I think that's so beautiful, Lupita, because I have had the privilege of seeing the show many, many times over and over again. And every time I see the show, it is so fresh. And I say this to you all when I see you. It's as if I'm seeing the show for the first time. And I think that's such a testament to everything that you're all talking about and those kinds of discoveries that you're able to make on stage. I thought I might open it up to a question or two before we have to wrap up. Yes? I'll repeat the question so everyone can hear it. I'm a playwright who leaves the Kansas City for the Wilco on the down, and I can play. And to see a theater full of people stand up and give an ovation for a story written by a black woman who provides nothing but five black women on stage, there's a playwright, I can not be told that doesn't happen, this is supposed to happen, and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. She said she wanted to leave diamonds and eggplants at our feet. <laughs> she did say that. Um, what she wanted to say was that uh, the experience of watching um, a play written and directed by black women and performed by five black women um, was, in, was invigorating because she herself is a playwright and she's often told that that um, cannot be. Oh. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask, I said there may be no answer to this, but from your experience in this, these men who are creating, who are creating these monstrous acts, they have mothers and they have sisters. So what is the, what creates the lack of humanity? 
The question is, the men in the play who are not on stage but are depicted off stage also have mothers and sisters, and so what creates that lack of humanity in people, in men, to be able to... Uh, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's such a good question. When I remember when I was young, um, reading about the war in the former Yugoslavia, um, and it, it traumatized me. Um, because I started becoming a news junkie then already. Um, and I could not understand how you could be living your life in your neighborhood, your suburban neighborhood, and then suddenly your friend next door's father could come into your house and rape you and your mother and your sister and your cousin. Um, and from, you know, I was, I was quite young when that war happened, but um, it's something that has stayed with me um, as, a, as a thing to investigate um, since then, and we see it everywhere. We see American soldiers doing that. In Kenya, there are you know, constantly reports of British soldiers then and now doing it. It is something that happens um, during war, and when you are waging war, it is actually part of the mandate to dehumanize your warriors, mm. is it not? Mm -hmm. um, and women are incredibly vulnerable during these kinds of times, and so then they become fodder. But it's not unique to this country, and it's not unique to this continent. Mm -hmm. It is a fact of our communal lives. Uh, yeah, and I, it's interesting. I mean, there's so many answers to that, because I mean, I was thinking about Liesl. Her name is Liesl, mm -hmm. because her mother loved Sound of Music. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking about that story, the story of when the character Liesl's boyfriend turns against the family and becomes a Nazi and tries to turn them in. So it is very much something that happens. It's universal. It's war related. But I was thinking of a story of a girl I met in Liberia who told me how she almost became like one of the girls you see. She almost became a wife. And this boy who was a friend of her family was caught the guy, the boy, who was taking her and two other girls to be wives and stopped him and said, no, not her. And they stood there and argued. He said, no, nope, not her, I'm taking her. No, you're not, yes, I am. No, nope, she's a friend of my family, you can't take her, I'm gonna take her. No, you're not, take those, but not her. And somehow he distracted him enough and made her run and that's why she did not become a wife. So sometimes it's acts of absolute arbitrary flashes of your humanity, and then, well, not them, but her. Not you. And these, these distinctions in, 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 I don't know how they make those variations. I don't know how that happens. But those are the various ways in which these things happen and can perpetuate themselves. And then every now and then a flash of humanity stops someone from doing something. It's, it's, it's a very, it's a comp, it's an eternal quest to figure out why we're capable of this as a human race. The other thing I, I would like to add, I mean, I get, I get so many incredibly beautiful <laughs> um, incredibly beautiful letters from strangers, uh, Facebook messages um, from strangers of, who have seen this play. And um, I want to actually amend what I said. Um, it's actually not just war, right? Um, I've gotten letters from girls who uh, were sexually assaulted in their college. Um, you know, um, it, the, it's, it's sort of, can't, yes, it's part of um, what we as women have to contend with. Um, and our, like the fight to create civil society, the fight to create equal rights um, can never ever end because this is part of, um, part of what that struggle um, can address, is that our lives have as much value as, as a man's life. And you know, sadly, there's so much violence against women right now that it's just like, it's not getting any better. And that is something that is really, it's so jarring and, and deeply disturbing and something that I, I so want, have to want to put all my attention on and want to encourage others to do the same because we've got to eradicate this problem. It's just, it's too rampant, it's everywhere. And it's all the time. And it's, uh, it's the statistics on it right here in the United States. Uh, are are shocking, um, right from child abuse to to gang rape, um, to college college rape, to date rape, 
it's just, it's constant and it's, it's, it's seriously an epidemic and I think the attention needs to go to it. I think we have time for two more questions, so yes, sir. Um, okay, so um, I want to ask about the play and I noticed uh, the play has a lot of, I would say like uh, Nigerians call it broken English. Um, so now, um, how did you merge, like, because an African can come see this play and say, this is a play that connects to me, but an American can also come see this play and say, so how did you merge that without, like, going too far to one side and making it a universal play, regardless of where you're from? And I wanted to also find out if you faced any pushback, because issues that have to do with Africa, like, um, that bring back our girls. After a few months, it just vanished, you know, and it wasn't in the media anymore. And the several killings that happened in um, the University of Kenya, also in Nigeria, you know, that don't get the media limelight. So, did you face any pushback bringing this play to the forefront of it? Those are two excellent questions. You're two for one right there. Uh, <laughs> why don't we start with what you refer to as the broken English, what we kind of talk about as the dialect. Yeah, the, the question was, sorry, you had such a beautiful voice, I thought maybe everyone had heard. Uh, the question was, the first two questions, the, the first question was around um, what our guest referred to as uh, kind of a broken English, what that dialect sounded like, and how it can be welcoming for Africans as well as non-Africans to feel kind of a connection to the show through the dialect or the language of the show. Ladies, do either of you want to jump into that? <laughs> I thought this was for Danai, but um, well, I think Danai obviously did a lot of research on, and she visited Liberia. She saw how Liberians spoke, and in the script, she wrote it like they talk, and um, and then so uh, we had a, a great dialect um, coach called Beth Maguire, who has tirelessly investigated African accents, one of them being li the Liberian accent. And we went through a whole dialect um, uh, process where we went extremely Liberian. And Liberians often drop their um, consonants. Uh, and we went com extreme to a point where uh, very few Americans would understand it. But we wanted to capture the authenticity first and foremost. And then we worked um, through adding the consonants and stuff so that we, it could be a milder Liberian accent and, uh, and, and in that way communicate with the American audience that we are, were preparing this play for. And um, I think that authenticity is something that then everyone can respond to because it is, it's, it's born of, uh, of Liberian, Liberian speech. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that's it, right? <laughs> and then our second question had to do with uh, if the company received any pushback around Bring Back Our Girls or issue when an issue happens in the world, the media is all over it for a certain amount of time and then stops paying attention and moves on to the next thing that's happening in the world, and now we're bringing that spotlight back onto these girls and if there was pushback or, or what that process was like. Um, I think that there's, I definitely experienced uh, skepticism from people about why or wh why the show is going to Broadway or whether the sh sh show belonged on Broadway. Um, you know, and my response is, I'm sure it's going to be obvious to you guys in the few minutes that you spent with me what my response to that is. <laughs> um, but who are you to tell me what belongs on Broadway? Yeah. You're not in charge. <laughs> it's so important, like, what you asked, because, you know, there's the idea of it goes on a spotlight, or they, and as, a, as an African, I know that sometimes we suffer from global low self-esteem, where literally we think that we talk about the they. And one thing I, I'm thankful for, and I don't even know where it came from, is that I, there's something in me that says, who's they? 
So it really is the idea that we do have to create the path. We do. And we, and we, have, to, we have to actually create our own hypothesis. It might not have ever been tested before, but our hypothesis is we matter and our voices are just as valuable as everybody else's and we can put them in any arena if we pursue our vision with excellence and it will resonate. Amen. I got very angry when I would get this, um, you know, people would just point blank say to me, you know, commercial producers, oh, I loved it at the public, it's an incredible play, but it really doesn't belong on Broadway. I mean, at a cocktail party in public, in front of people, um, you know, but what, what the, the statement is astounding, but the, um, the, the kind of confidence and um, obliviousness that the statement is made is what really fired me up um, because I realized, oh, there, 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 people do think that there's only one kind of thing that belongs on, on, on Broadway or that, you know, is commercial and, um, and that's just not true. Um, and, you know, I'm very grateful to Andy and to our producers um, for, for saying we're going to take a great big risk, but we, we believe that, the, that, it, that it, it has a place like any other story. Um, Certainly what is challenging is that um, it's an intense story. And, um, but you know, so is Long Day's Journey in Tonight. <laughs> Last question. Great question. The question was around the comedy in the show, and was that something that Denai had thought about from the beginning that would be part of the world of the show, or was it something that developed as the characters came more into creation? Yeah, thanks. I think, uh, for me, the, the, the focus is always about accessibility and authenticity. So those are always the things I'm writing. I'm, as a Zimbabwean who's also American-born, I'm always looking for that. Uh, those two things to work together in, in what I create, and and to and to disarm an audience, to make them feel connected, comfortable not not comfortable, but <laughs> comfortable in the sense that they're having a full meal, they're experiencing a full gamut of emotions and responses, and seeing full complex people. That that what I'm working against, the thing that makes fills me with outrage is the idea, what I've seen many times, is the very singular dimensional representation of people from over there. So really to crack that open and open up these people into being very complex and un unexpected is something that I do pursue. As I step into this, so that's always a goal of mine, that's a macro um, global goal of mine as an artist. As I step into the narrative, into this narrative, finding these characters was very interesting and thankfully I was around very fascinating people in Liberia who, who sparked different things in me as I wrote. But you get to this point, it's gonna sound kooky, but you get to this point as a writer where they start talking. They start talking. And um, you know, it was really exciting when I started to find the dynamic between these women, especially like in those first five scenes where it's just the three of them in there. That those, the, the dynamics and, and the history that, that number two brings in the room and the history between them all and, and just sort of starting to find who these women were and their specific idiosyncrasies. And that's where a lot of humor just, you know, Bessie just started to become that girl. She started to become who she was. And their di her dynamic with, with Helena started to become what that was. And so all these, and the, the, the ways in which they would have their little moments and fight over things like little girls. Um, those, those things just started to come to the page and come through them, through me. But the goal, yes, is definitely, why would you not see, so survival is not about lying down and saying, woe is me. Survival is about finding your light and choosing to make sure it shines in the darkest circumstances. So why not see these women truly, uh, you know, portray, live in, in their fullness? That's how they're coping. And so I had to let them do that. And as a result, yes, I, I also want to disarm you. I, I definitely want to disarm you. But thankfully, they show, these characters showed me the way as I wrote them.
I just want to say it is such a privilege for me to be on the stage with all of you. I so deeply respect and admire you all as artists and to be a part of the show for all of us involved is just such a deep, deep privilege. So thank you. Thank you to this extraordinary audience.